I'm here at DM Targets with Seth Gardner, the owner. In this video, we're going to learn how steel targets are made. Gavin Gu here from UltimateReloader.com. Thank you, Seth, for having me down. Thank Always you. good to see you. Great seeing you, man. <laughs> this is going to be fun. We're talking about the start to finish process of how you conceive of steel targets, how you cut steel targets, how you finish them, and how you get them out the door. Uh, but before we talk about that, tell me about how you think about steel targets and all of the other considerations kind of as a system. Well, it is a system. You, you absolutely hit that on the nail on the head. The, uh, it's the target, it's the hanger, it's shipping, it's everything. Everything has to work together mm -hmm. to get the target to the customer for the price that's right and uh, for a product that's going to work for what they need it to work for. And you're a shooter, you're a competitor. And I think that gives you a different perspective and a different level of understanding, right? You use steel targets all the time. I do. Right, you've see, seen failure points. I've seen failure points, sharp inside corners on a nipstick target and a crack going at a 45 degree angle, uh, targets with welded on brackets separating. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Absolutely, uh, geometry of the target, is critical. Uh, hanging system is critical. Welds or weld placement mm -hmm. is critical. Um, little details that you'd think wouldn't matter make mm -hmm. a pretty big difference on a steel target. So what are the main parts? When you think of this system, what are the main elements of that? Well, so you've got the target and the target design, mm -hmm. right? You've got the target material and the thickness. Okay. And then you've got the hanger and the, the hanging system, so right. to speak, right? So, I mean, you've got a T-post hanger or if like in a rimfire set up a uh, step-in hanger <laughs> or you know, a two by four hanger, right? So they all have slightly different properties, but at the end of the day, what you want is you want to have the target stay on. Mm -hmm. You want this target to be reactive. You want yep. the target to be loud and you want it to be fun to shoot at. And you want it to stay there. You don't want to be going right. and fixing it, right? Is yes. Nothing's worse than putting a target out at 500 yards, shoot it three times, target falls yep. down. Now you're walking 500 yards. Nobody wants to do that. I remember the first time you came to Ultimate Reloader and I said, so are we going to hang these with chains? And you said, no, <laughs> you don't want to do that. And I found out later, you know, we've had chain hung targets and they break and they flop around and they don't, they did this, they're not as reliable and they don't work the same way as, as these targets. Oh, we knocked the target right off the chain. Yeah, chains have been the way it's been done for a long time, and they, they do work, but they're not optimal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's j just because that's the way we've done it for the last 30 years doesn't mean we necessarily have to continue to do it that mm -hmm. way. Uh, there are times where that can be a reasonable way to do it, but we try to avoid that whenever we can yeah. with our stuff. So. Your, your hangers I've been enjoying because they're simple to place on a T-post, mm -hmm. and you have two different options. You've got this traditional hook and the key hook, right? Correct. And there is a mechanical separation between the target and the hanger, which gives you better acoustics, but it also helps that energy dissipation, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing is taking the full brunt. Everything can kind of move a little bit. P precisely. Right? Is with, with the target, you want your target to last as long as possible, mm -hmm. and so how you make that target last is you allow it to dissipate its energy. Um, and give it time to dissipate that energy. If mm -hmm. you've got a firm locked up system where that target's bolted in rigid, mm -hmm. it's having to transfer all its energy right now. Yeah. It's hard on the target and it's hard on the hanger uh, and you're not gonna get as much life. And you're, on, you're also not gonna get ring out of the target and you're not gonna get dance out of the target. You're not mm -hmm. gonna be able to tell by the way that target moves where you hit on the target. Right. You're just or, gonna get a thud. Which is critical, if, especially if you have conditions where you can't spot your misses seeing that hit on the target is kind of sometimes all you have, especially if you can't get good trace either, you know. Oh, oh absolutely. And it's in my sport, which is precision rifle, is seeing that target react is critical mm -hmm. to making those small corrections that keep you on steel. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at DM you have a lot of different products, including different types of stands, you know, rim fire movers, rim fire target sets, all that. Let's focus on center fire targets. Okay. Let's talk about the complete process. Let's say you have a new target that you're gonna that you're gonna offer to the public. You know, what's where do you start? So I mean, the first thing I'm gonna do when let's say it's just a, a shape of a target, say a, a new animal or whatnot, I'm gonna draw like that like a rock chuck, maybe. like a rock chuck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'll draw that thing up in CAD, and okay. then I will play with a couple different 
drawings of it. I'll find, find some images that I like and then see how they look in silhouette, which is critical mm -hmm. because something that may look good in a picture, once it's in silhouette, looks like a, a misshapen blob. So it's got to be the right. Right, right silhouette we choose. And then we draw it in CAD, we find our center of gravity, um, and then we tune the mounting system to for reliability, for, uh, for, uh, for reactivity, Yep. And, for, and for acoustics, right? So anytime we can, we're going to try to make that target as loud as possible, but yep. not at the expense of reliability, right? Correct. So yeah. I want that target to stay on the hanger more than I want it to ring, but I want it to ring really good. So we're, anytime we can check all those boxes, we're definitely going to do it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll once we get the drawing done, I'll go and I'll make one up and mm -hmm. then I'll test it and run it through its paces, put a bunch of rounds on it, yeah. see how it does, see how it works, see how it, you know, whatnot, talk to a couple people, see what people think of it, if they mm -hmm. like it, and maybe make some tweaks, maybe change some geometry a little bit, maybe change the, the balance point of scotch. Yeah, I noticed when we were working in CAD earlier today, Yeah. and, and the first thing I noticed was you mentioned stress concentrations mm -hmm. and basically filleting corners, you know, providing those radiuses so that you don't get the cracks, which, you know, we studied that in mechanical engineering, stress concentrations and all that, so I was, I was, I was glad to see that. And then also where you found the center of gravity is the sort of the geometric center or the mass center of, of the actual target, right? But you were talking about you can go, the hanging point can be above that, it can be close to that, right? And, and that distance will change how, how the, the target dances and, and all that. So is that a parameter that you would test in the field, like try a couple different positions and then see how they react in the field? Depending on the target, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, a, a lot of targets are kind of similar to each other. And so I can I can take some stuff that I know from previous targets and plug that in. No, I'm going to be pretty successful and I'll test it and, and be pretty happy with it. Uh, but yeah, as I sometimes will take a target out. It's like, man, I wish this thing was a little more reactive or I wish this thing was a little louder. I mean, to the point where I'll even change the geometry of the target just a little bit, just to put that, that mounting spot in the precise location that I need it to be to get what I want out of that target. Gotcha. It's like the hole in a guitar, right? <laughs> if you move it around, it's gonna change how it's gonna sound, right? Precisely. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So you've got the design figured out you then go to material, right? Let's talk about the, the material that you're gonna pick, the type and the thickness, you know, for center fire. So we do everything out of AR500. Um, I don't mess with AR400, AR550, just mm -hmm. everything's AR500, works really good. It's, there's a lot of reasons for it. We could go into length and then <laughs> we can talk about that for an hour, but is I choose AR500 for all my targets, even my rimfire stuff, and okay. then, um, the thickness is really a, a use uh, scenario. Uh, so if it's a really small target, yeah, we're going to bump up that thickness for, for longevity. Is that because of like energy concentration basically it, on the target? It, it, exactly. Is yeah. a small target is going to have lower mass, right? And that mass is only going to be absorbed so much energy before the target fails. The, the target will fail eventually after enough energy is put into it. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can increase that mass, we can increase the amount of energy that target is able to with, withstand. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, and it actually can cut down on the reactivity, which on a small target can be too much reactivity. Right? We want mm -hmm. that target to move, but we don't want that target to spin in circles. Right. And so right. <laughs> by adding a little more mass in the right places can mm -hmm. kind of calm things down. And then a lot of it, depends on the end use of the target and the range the customer's gonna shoot the target at. So if they are shooting 308 at 1200 yards and they want a large target, we may thin up that target for them to, to keep the cost down, mm -hmm. to make the target more reactive, make it more loud, and then also make it easier for them to place the target. Yeah, right? that can be a major issue. Yes, it is, especially <laughs> when you're placing them on hillsides yeah like where where i am <laughs> yes um you know so so you know you got to factor all these things in and yep. then uh you know is, or if somebody's going to be shooting with uh, say magnums mm -hmm. uh, higher energy stuff at, at moderate ranges we're going to up that thickness mm -hmm. so it it just comes down to what the customer's doing with it and balancing cost reliability longevity 
and um, and ease of use. You know, mm -hmm. is all these little factors come into play. So you've got three eighths, and you've got half. Is that is that correct? Almost. You got we got quarters. Well, and okay, quarter, right? Yes, and we can <laughs> go use other thicknesses. Uh, those mm -hmm. are the the ones traditionally we generally use quarter through half. Okay. Um, I've made targets three quarters thick for public ranges. Um, we use some three sixteenths. It's not one of our main stuff we use. Most mm -hmm. we use that for for rimfire targets and okay. extended range gotcha. kind of deal. But yep. is which it's we should talk in the about stable. another time. Rimfire targets are are their whole other thing. They are. Yeah. Um, and a lot of fun. <laughs> but yeah, is that so half through quarter? Those okay. are your your main staples, and three eighths is is going to be your most commonly used. It's 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 a nice in between. Okay. And then we've got your forklift here, right? Yes. <laughs> this is heavy stuff, right? And, it is. And what size sheets are you typically working with? Uh, so my current equipment is only rated for uh, four by eight sheets. So that's big. That's that's <laughs> what I run four by eights. But yep. Actually, I'd like to step it up to a little larger machine, but. That's what we're dealing with at nice. the time being. So you've got the forklift, you place the sheet on uh -huh. the table. Let's talk about the cutting machine real quick. Uh, so it is a shop saber uh, CNC mm -hmm. run hypertherm uh, plasma cutter. Gotcha. And it's a, a water bath plasma. So the the table fills with water and the tar and the material sits right above it. And then it does two things for us. One, it keeps the fumes and smoke in check. Yeah, but hardly also, any, really. Yes, yes. And <laughs> uh, the other thing it also does is it cools that steel mm -hmm. as it's being cut to the point where I could cut a target this size. And as soon as that torch comes off, I can reach and grab my bare hands. So yeah. it keeps the heat affected zone in check, keeps the, the temper of the steel uh, unmodified as much as possible. There will always nice. be a little bit, but it's very, very minimal. Yeah, So, very cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's talk about like how many targets are you cutting at a time? Do you cut a full sheet? Do you cut a half sheet? Does it depend? It, it kind of depends. Um, so ideally, I'd be cutting whole sheets at a time. Yep. But, but often, uh, as a customer will order a special order target, I've got all the inventory I need for the time being on the thing. I'll throw a sheet on and cut his special target and you know, just a couple others to fill mm -hmm. in the inventory as needed. So I'm not afraid to cut a quarter sheet or even cut a single target out of a sheet. Right. Um, we, like I said, ideally we'd be cutting full sheets every time, but just it just doesn't work out that mm -hmm. way. And we're happy to do partial sheets as needed. Right. Yeah. Now when you're cutting hangers, how many, how many hangers do you do at a time? So, so <laughs> hangers, I will cut whole sheets at a time if I can, or if I have like a half sheet where I'm doing something for a customer, mm -hmm. I will fill the rest of the sheet up with hanger components, stuff like that. That is one of the things we'll often do is find dead space or, or utilize the rest of the sheet and stuff mm -hmm. that we know we're going to burn through. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've burned the targets. Yeah. You've got to separate them from the, the waste material, right? Mm -hmm. Pull them off the table. What happens then? Uh, so then depending on the size of the target and what kind of target it is uh, or a component, uh, smaller stuff we'll throw in our tumbler and we'll okay. let it we'll let it air dry and then we'll tumble it and that puts a nice finish on it knocks all the stuff off all the dross off from the cutting yeah and then goes on the shelf mm -hmm. uh, larger targets we're gonna go in we're gonna hand wire wheel them and do any mm -hmm. any touch up with grinder if we need to you know say say you got a little pip sticking out here or there you know we'll mm -hmm. clean that up and shelve them no painting none of that stuff right yeah. Very cool. Okay. And then now you've got a stack of finished targets, mm -hmm. right? And you've got an inventory of different, you know, high volume items are going to be stocked more and go out the door more and all that. Uh, and then shipping. Let's talk about shipping. Shipping steel is not a real easy or inexpensive proposition typically. Right? It has <laughs> definitely been a learning experience shipping steel. Shipping heavy products across mm -hmm. the country and internationally is we're always learning new little lessons on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've done a lot to to keep our shipping costs in check and that's how we're able to offer our free shipping under uh, over two hundred dollars right is by keeping our, our, our shipping prices in check and then also keeping our our success rate high. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we often think about the cost of the shipping. Another cost is when the customer receives an empty box. Right. And so we do a lot of stuff to try to <laughs> mitigate that. I'm not going to say it never happens, but by keeping that low and then doing some negotiating and doing some clever boxing mm -hmm. and uh, 
clever working with some rates, mm -hmm. we're able to get those uh, those products to our customers reliably and inexpensively. Yeah. Which in the end means their products cost less. Yeah. Well, I certainly appreciate what you do. You guys are a family run business. Mm -hmm. You're here in the United States. You use U.S. steel and I think that that sets you guys above the competition. And you're a part of the community. I know you and Sheena give a lot back to the community. You're a part of it. And the community here in the Pacific Northwest is a little bit like a family. It's the best way I could describe it. Oh, it, it certainly <laughs> is. And you know, this is the, the shooting community up here is amazing. But mm -hmm. the shooting community nationwide is amazing. I've got yeah. I've got close friends clear across the country. Yeah. You know, from just from, from shooting. Yeah. And uh, you know, I've you know, the number of people that you could just call and say, hey, I'm broke down, and they'll drop what they're doing to come fix you from this community is amazing. Yeah. So, is we love the people in the community, mm -hmm. and it's great being part of it. And, you know, we, we are part of it. I am a competitive shooter. My wife has finally started shooting competitively. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah, she's doing the rimfire thing, but she's having a good time. And, uh, yeah, it, it's just, just amazing. And then I get to test products, and, and I get to talk to match structures and see what they're, they're looking for and what they're needing. And yeah and help solve some of the problems that are out there. You know, that's one of the things I really enjoy about this business is being able to solve those problems. Yeah, that's good yeah. stuff. Well, thanks for having me down. I really appreciate it. Thanks, and Kevin. to you all, Seth and I have some tricks up our sleeve. We've got some really cool stuff that we're working on together that you're gonna see here in the coming months. What we'd like to know from you is, what do you think of these DM targets? What are your favorite targets to shoot and what are you shooting them with? Drop a comment and we'll start a discussion. Hey, if people want to know more about DM targets? Uh, D-mtargets.com. <laughs> That's right, go there now. Thanks everybody. That concludes this video and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, where we've got unrestricted content and Instagram. Make sure to follow us on all those channels. Ultimate Reloader also has a commercial solutions division serving law enforcement, the military, and the gun industry. We have some unique capabilities, including a comprehensive suite of recoil testing and evaluation capabilities, trigger profiling, and more. If you're interested in custom rifles like what we build here on the channel or gunsmithing services, you're gonna wanna go to rifles.ultimatereloader.com and get on the wait list. If you wanna learn lucrative gunsmithing like what I show here on the channel, including building custom rifles and Cerakote plus a whole bunch more, you're gonna to wanna to check out the Colorado School of Trades, schooloftrades.edu. Thanks again for watching.